Okay, so heads up, this video is probably going to sound ranty and probably going to sound whiny because, I mean, you could just boil what I'm saying down to Wah! Why did not Why did people not agree with me? But if you hear me out first, that would be cool because I am trying to make a relevant point. So I'm giving a heads up. And yes, this is just my opinion, but having to say this is also one of my complaints, which we'll obviously get to. This video is also split in two. The first part is going to be me really defending my point in a generalised fashion, and the second part is me explaining all of my choices in the last video in more detail, to basically add context to where I'm coming from, because a lot of people seem to really miss the point, and somebody ended up making a huge Reddit post about it, so the second part is about that post. Now, in a nutshell, sometimes, I, I really fucking hate the Dark Souls community. Perhaps this isn't just related to Dark Souls, it could be YouTube, it might just be people in general, but recently it's the first time it's ever gotten to me. I will also say basically none of this applies to my own sub base, oddly enough. You all seem to be on my side with most of the things, which is cool. And also, right, I'm not inherently against people disagreeing with me. In fact, I like being proven wrong sometimes, because it lets me know if an idea or an opinion I have can be better, as long as the reason holds out, obviously. Anyway, the Dark Souls fanbase, I guess, really can annoy me sometimes, and I've never understood what people meant until recently, but it has never been more evident than in my last video. Now, it's not just the fact people are saying they don't want any changes to the upcoming remaster, or not agreeing with me, it's just the, the way people are saying it, and the reasoning behind it that doesn't make any sense to me. It should be blatantly obvious that what I'm saying is just for discussion, just some ideas, just my thoughts and opinions, and honestly, I'd say some pretty good ideas, but if you don't agree, that's fine, whatever. There's a few I look back on and think, eh, you know, maybe not, such as the four ring slots, although we will get to that. But the reasoning behind the complaints with the list seem to be, you know, oh, you just want Dark Souls 3. False. Dark Souls 1 is perfect to begin with. Definitely false. I want to play Dark Souls 1 the way it was meant to be played. Um, you already can, by the way. You don't want a remaster, you want a remake. Now, this is technically true, but I honestly don't think that my changes are that outside the scope of a remaster. Especially if you look at Scholar, and even at that, I know we're almost certainly not going to see these changes. I see it in the video, and yet people still get at me, as if I'm attacking them personally, and I just don't understand it. It will lose the charm. Yeah, the charm of all the shit people complained about in the first game. Clunky UI, having to give humanity to the Fair Maiden, backstabs, poise, lost Isleth. Even if you ignore the changes that change, like, the feel of the game, how can you justify not having any of these be changed or tweaked? The weird thing is, everyone says the change of 60 FPS and better textures is fine. Why be for that change but nothing else if the logic is to play it vanilla? You already can play Dark Souls 1 like this anyway! Fucking everyone under the sun gets it Bethesda for releasing Skyrim 40 times, but this gets a free pass? Personally for me, as jaded as I am, it's just hard to justify spending money on something I basically already own, and have played to death for years. And then um, other people will say that I just hate Dark Souls 1, or love Dark Souls 3 or 2 more, or some retarded shit like that. So my reasoning for why Dark Souls 1 Remaster should have changes made to it, and I'm aware there won't be any, is simple. Vanilla Dark Souls 1 already exists. I'd argue that most of the people that will buy the remaster are people that have played the game before anyway. I may be wrong, but I suspect it. Dark Souls 1 is well known at this stage, and if it interested you, you'd have played it, let's be fair. Obviously many new people will play it, but the crux of my argument is that we've all played Dark Souls 1 before, and Dark Souls 1 Vanilla is readily available to play in 60fps, with better textures, at whatever fucking resolution you want. Now, I'd give my arm to play Dark Souls 1 for the first time again, and this remaster is a fantastic chance to get as close to that as possible. Now, especially in this day and age, new players could be put off by some of the dated sensibilities of Dark Souls 1 that didn't really add much to the game anyway. Now, I'm not at all calling for the game to be easier. I want it to be harder, honestly. Just like how levelling up at bonfires is a better mechanic than warping back to a hub. Personally, I'd say that being able to, for example, change covenants via its own independent item, like in Dark Souls 3, rather than having to warp back and forth, is just a better system. And the only real counter-argument is charm. You can still have the consequences involved in doing it, changing covenants can still give you sin, you just don't need to have to jump through a hoop to do it. And it really doesn't add anything to the game. In the same way I hated warping back and forth to a hub, I don't need my time wasted. Now this is just an example of one thing that me, I would, personally, change about Dark Souls 1 to make it a little more playable for 2018, that I'd argue wouldn't ruin the feel of the game at all anyway. The real experience of Dark Souls 1 comes from the amazing world design, the NPCs, the atmosphere, its own unique challenge it gives you. 
Tertiary aspects such as UI especially don't matter and especially wouldn't affect this. Another argument is basically what Fatty said in his video about the Prepare to Die Again mod. That mod lets you get as close to playing Dark Souls 1 for the first time again as we can get. I've played a little bit of it because obviously we will let's play the shit out of this so I don't want to ruin it but it's really fucking cool to experience. So an updated Dark Souls 1 would still give that first time experience to new players because they're playing it for the first time and also old players. To suggest that item placements, enemy placements, boss AI and HP etc can't be made any better at all in any aspect just seems like a fallacy to me. I say this because so many of the comments were saying they want nothing changed at all and it just sounds honestly a lot like rose tinted nostalgia goggles. An argument I received was people saying they want the experience of playing Dark Souls 1 with a full audience again. Surely a tweaked Dark Souls 1 would actually give that experience more than a vanilla one because then for a few weeks or at least a week-ish everyone is in the dark about things still. You know experienced players are going to know a bit more than new players but it bridges the gap and if anything that's desirable surely. Nobody wants to be getting twinked 6 hours into the game's release and a changeless Dark Souls 1 is 100% going to have that happen. I mean if nothing's changed I'm, I'm fucking tearing the shit out of Anor Orlando, simple as that. Now please understand, I get that not everyone has access to Dark Souls 1 vanilla, but even then not everyone has access to everything, no matter what. You just need to make some sacrifices? As an example, for Bloodborne to exist, it needed to be in PS4, and frankly, if it means some people can't play Dark Souls 1 vanilla, I think it's worth an updated Dark Souls 1 that they can still play, and like I said, still get that first time experience, because they have nothing to compare it to. Like I said, you know, we would all be going in blind, semi-blind in the world of Dark Souls 1. That's a lot more first time than half the player base going in blind and the other half sorting out their twink builds. And in fact, if Dark Souls 1 Remaster is going to be a $60 game, you can in fact buy an Xbox 360 in Dark Souls 1 for that price. So, I mean, where's your argument? You know, if you want to play vanilla, that is. And don't worry, I understand the argument is playing 1080 60fps with a rebooted community. But if you want to play it that badly vanilla, you know, why are you waiting for a remaster? It just seems so fucked up to me that you can't even criticise or suggest that Dark Souls 1 could be improved in some way, especially for simply just wanting to discuss it, and especially without saying very obvious things like, this is my opinion. You know, if you don't say that, they seem to think you're also saying, if I had it my way, you'd be putting a fucking gulag for disagreeing with me, I hate you, I hate your fucking mum, ideally you wouldn't die, you'd be erased from history, so you never existed in the first fucking place. Although, I mean, maybe that applies to this guy. So hopefully you guys see where I'm coming from now. Hopefully you maybe agree now or perhaps change your mind and hopefully you would also understand I know it's a remaster, I'm not hoping for much, I would just like some changes to justify my purchase and I'm still gonna buy it regardless but I just want to discuss things. Now the next part of my video is gonna be I guess a rebuttal to a reddit post made about my last video. The reason I want to do this is because I feel like his post made me think I really need to clear up my reasoning for a bunch of my points. The video was meant to be quite laid back and relaxed and quick fire but it just sparked a bunch of outrage and again you know I like the discussion and I like changing people's minds so if I can fuck it why not. There's a lot to get through so I'll try to go as fast as I can. Now remember at this point it's just the discussion for my ideas, I'm only contributing to the back and forth, I'm not calling them out or ask, you know, attacking the dude or anything like that. I just like discussing things and hopefully once I've went over my ideas, it would be nice if you ended up agreeing with me. That is my stance, do not infer any more information, please. So he starts off saying that my solutions were bad. I guess I should maybe have specified that I'm not claiming to have every answer, merely I'm suggesting my solutions for identified problems, of which I compiled a list from of user feedback so it's not even my problems in the whole, it's other people's. Personally. I think most of my ideas are pretty slick and again I'm gonna reiterate I know it's only a remaster. Now there's a few things on the list that if they were going to change something I would expect them more than others but ultimately I don't expect any of it to happen. I don't think anything on the list is completely outside the scope of a remaster. It's also just a wish list, purely hypothetical, my opinion and ultimately just for fun. Fix the ledge. He's finding this which is good, this point was really honestly more of a joke point but it is true and other things that end in a player's death that isn't their fault really should be fixed. Oddly enough he says that this should be fixed but not other things because other issues with the game add to its charm. Now it does just seem a bit like cherry picking to me, why doesn't this add to the game's charm? 
And I know it's subjective, honestly I do. This is just me adding my own subjectivity to this rebuttal. We do Isolith. Now, he does make a really valid point here. There is a difference between weak points of the game and outright flaws that don't work. However, at the same time, he does say that the entire area is bad. Again, saying that it might be bad, but it adds to the charm. So with this, I say that the charm already exists in vanilla Dark Souls 1. Changing enemy layout so it just isn't fucking dragon asses, so the area has an actual purpose would be nice. All these changes would give the remaster its own unique charm and flavour, the same way it did to Scholar. I find it very hard to see how anybody wouldn't want that. Now, we also need to understand that this is a best case scenario, so saying, oh it wouldn't happen or it wouldn't really be possible, because we aren't talking about if it could or couldn't happen, we're talking about if it was to happen. Isleth is a chore, charm or not, I don't know a single person that enjoys Isleth. It was definitely the most requested change and for a good reason. Ultimately, it just drags the quality of Dark Souls 1 down. If there's any way of improving that experience, I'm for it. Redo Crystal Caves plus Seath. I guess a lot of the arguments against my points just boils down to flaws equals charm and me simply disagreeing, however, he still agrees that Seath is bad. Also, he makes some weird assumption, which is a trend that goes down the full list. He assumes that remaking Crystal Caves would just change the feel entirely, which I don't get. One, I didn't even specify how I would change it. Two, given that I didn't specify it and just said that I wanted it to be better, why in that instance would you just make it worse in your head? It could be anything. It's totally subjective. I'm giving you the chance to insert your own perfect vision of the Crystal Caves and you just go, nah, it'll be shit, mate. That doesn't really make any sense to me. My reasoning for not liking the caves is that the main gimmick is really half-baked. The invisible paths aren't used to their fullest potential. In my head, as an example, if I was to design them, again, my fantasy crystal caves and my waifu insert, you can have your own vision of it, but mine would be, aside from obviously changing the layout overall, but I agree I would still keep the openness of the caves, perhaps have the ability to go down to the bottom, where there's difficult enemies there. This also gives speedrunners a guaranteed path through the area, or you could take the invisible paths, which is much faster, but the paths change their layout every so often, and the game gives you like a little flash of the new layout. So the challenge is quickly memorising these new paths to take, whilst you can have some sort of slow, annoying enemy chasing you like those uh, blood flies in Blighttown, and their attacks can knock you off. If you take too long, that is a very broad scope of how I'd do the caves. I don't know why he thinks that means it can't be open and have a lot of negative space, I really don't. So. Like, if you just don't want anything changed, then sure, whatever. But, if you then try to say that my idea is bad because you just assume changing anything would definitely result in something worse, that's not really an argument for my idea being bad. Fixing backstabs. So this point might be valid. He says backstabs aren't the issue, it's the connection. Possibly true. However, the connections are never going to be 100% perfect. And I feel like that's what the backstab mechanic in Dark Souls 3 sought to fix with the little wind-up. In Dark Souls 3, when you got backstabbed, you really deserved it. In my opinion, it totally works as a valid punish. I'd want to move away from the backstab meta of Dark Souls 1 personally, as I feel like it really takes a lot away from the game. If you enjoyed it, then fine, I, I get that people did. But, you know, that's on your list, and this is on mine. The password system. So, you're fine with this. Well, good. But, wouldn't the ability to easily play with friends instead of jumping through hoops ruin the charm? Nah, but seriously, I think this is the point I'm trying to make. Why is why are some things fine, but others are not? Fixing all bugs. So this point, I can kind of see his side. There is a good argument here. Somebody else argued that the bugs were akin to wave dashing in Smash Brothers, which I definitely get. Fixing the backstabs would certainly make some of the bugs less required, that's for sure. But I do think that unlike wave dashing, things like dead angle can just be pretty unfair. Dead angle itself making a lot of weapons like super fucking hard to counter and a lot of other weapons completely redundant. So I mean, if you like Dark Souls 1's really, you know, broken, buggy, laggy PvP, and by the way, I say that with no actual hint of passive aggressiveness, then, you know, if you like that, I can totally understand this point. But as I'm not a fan of that and I prefer Dark Souls 2 and 3's more balanced PvP, Fixing the bugs also opens the PvP up to more usable builds, if the main tactic isn't just one shot with wog or backstab fish, and yeah I know that is simplifying it a bit, but you know there's definitely a relevant point in what I'm saying, I mean it's, you know, what everybody knows where I'm coming from. You know, I just prefer the dynamic of Dark Souls 2 and 3's PvP just compared to 1, simple as that. Not that I dislike 1's PvP either by the way, I just, that's just what I prefer. Omnidirectional rolling. So, 
This is one of the points that would change how Dark Souls 1 plays. I don't think it changes it that much, but uh, anyway, there's a big asterisk next to this point. Anyway, he says that you shouldn't change things for the sake of changing. And personally, I don't see anything wrong with changing things, even if it is just to give it a new feel. Now, this was another highly requested thing. Personally, I don't actually even really see an issue with the four-way rolling, but as we're going on best case scenario, the argument of time and money to make it happen isn't relevant. Now, if omnidirectional rolling was introduced, enemies would need to be changed to compensate for the easier, more forgiving rolling mechanics. Now, I'd say this is a change that would make the game more playable for 2018. People probably refer to this as one of the points that make it seem like I just want Dark Souls 3, but no, like, there is so much more going on under the hood than just omnidirectional rolling that makes Dark Souls 3 play the way it does. For, for one, you know, you get far more out of your stamina in Dark Souls 3 than 1, which contributes, if anything, a lot more than the omnidirectional rolling for how it feels. J just as, like, one example, and there's so, so many more. Carry weight as its own stat. Right, so, look, I'm sorry, man, but you, you really, this guy really is just straight up wrong with every point that he makes. Stamina and equipment load isn't only bad because of poise. I don't even think I suggested that as my only point in the video. And Dark Souls 1 would have the same amount of stats as Dark Souls 3 if carry weight and stamina were split, and the PvP level for that is 120. All it does is allow the player to make more informed choices about their builds. It increases variety and stops, you know, the issue of players wearing heavy armour and inherently getting more swings with a weapon than someone with less endurance. And it also means that if you want more swings, you don't inherently get to put on heavier armour as well. It means you can make a fast build and a tanky build as two separate entities. And if you want both, you need to invest in both. This isn't a change for the sake of change. There's a reason, a very good reason for why they split it in future games. He then goes on to discredit his points by saying resistance is fine, which is a totally useless stat in an RPG. That really isn't fine if you ask me. Now, I'm an advocate for saying that if the PvP is balanced, it makes the PvE more fun. It allows players to actually make builds they have to stick to, rather than having to make self-imposed rules. In my opinion, that feels a little nicer when playing an RPG, especially something like Dark Souls. I really have no idea how we can say, without a shadow of a doubt, that balanced PvP will reduce fun. Ba based on what, exactly? Nothing nothing would suggest that. More HP on Pinwheel, etc. So, it's nice we actually agree that Pinwheel is ruined because of its shitty HP pool. Maybe you're right, actually, in that more HP is actually all that's needed. So, okay, I'll give you this one, potentially. As you're right, it would reward the players for taking advantage of such a thing without inherently ruining the boss without it, because it just dies immediately. Improving the UI. So... Right, honestly, this is where I feel like his arguments kind of fall apart, so to speak. He doesn't want an objectively better UI because of nostalgia and comfort, which is where most of his arguments I honestly do think are coming from. Now, again, it is fine to just want base vanilla Dark Souls 1, but I will warn you guys that you know nostalgia can be great, but it can also be blinding and restrictive. You shouldn't let it get in the way of improvements or change or progression. The Dark Souls 1 UI is, is really not good, especially for console, because list-based UIs are really bad for consoles. And it isn't a change for the sake of change. It doesn't take anything away from the game. That's like saying Sky UI takes away from the charm of Skyrim's UI, which it really fucking doesn't. Now again, another point. Why is consuming multiple soul items at a time fine, and doesn't detract from the charm of the game, but an improved UI overall does do that? So, again, we have another argument that simply assumes the worst outcome from a th small thing that I said. Why would being able to swap Covenant items mean that it makes being in a Covenant have any less impact? Why is that a necessity to that point? You could easily have the NPC automatically equip the Covenant, you know, once you join it, and then by taking it off to change to another Covenant would result in a big ominous message and a warning prompt, etc. So you know you fucked up if you take it off. Plus, this is something that you can easily just self-impose anyway, if you want to. If you want to stick to one covenant, you can. Just let the people that want to play the fucking game play it without jumping through unnecessary hoops. Plus, the NPCs would just act the exact same way anyway. Why would anything about the NPCs need to change? Like, all that would happen is you just get an extra item when you join the covenant that you can equip. That way, you also don't need to take up a valuable ring slot for auto-summon covenants. Like, this problem you have is easily solved with, like, two seconds of thought. So, again, you assume the worst when 
what you're assuming can easily be fixed along with my idea anyway. Streamlining and improving covenants. Okay, so this point is explained in far greater detail than the scope of this video allows in one of my other videos. So go watch the Perfect Dark Souls game series or how to improve Dark Souls series and watch the covenants video. But essentially, making it so the Way of White does something, you know, the, the Chaos Covenant has a point outside of PvE, that kind of thing. The issue is, in a nutshell, offline covenants aren't really a thing. Take for example, why does the Chaos Covenant need to be a covenant, right? Why do you need to actively be in that covenant, essentially locking you out of potential online interactions, you know, when everything she does would just be the same if she was just an NPC with an ongoing quest? You know, the same with the Covenant of Champions, it locks you out of offline play, so why does it need to be a Covenant when it's simply just a huge condition that's put on the game? The Dark Divers, none of that needs to be a Covenant, it's just basically an NPC quest that is also a Covenant. You know, you kind of see where I'm getting at now, all these things can still exist, I'm not saying take them out of the game, I think it's just silly to call them Covenants if they don't have an online aspect. I mean. Maybe I'm wrong here, but surely you can see where I'm coming from, surely. Like, now, this point is probably outside the scope of a remaster, but Dark Souls 1 Covenants, they really are kind of hit and miss. Changing mechanics for a few of them would be nice. For instance, allowing new game players to see Gravelord signs, or the Gravelord only affects new game plus players, that would be good. Um, you know, allowing the Dragon Covenant summon sign to, you know, be seen by a lot more players, that would be good. There's a few tweaks you could do, but ultimately it would be nice for each covenant to be, you know, fully fleshed out with good rewards and, you know, have their own specific interaction with online. Because both, you know, the Way of White and the Princess Guard, they do kind of lack in comparison to, say, the Dark Wraiths or the Dark Moons. So, but seriously, go watch my video, it is full of really good ideas. Moving on to item placements. So by this point, I've explained why new item placements are good. He says to install a mod if I want that. Or, I mean, the argument works the other way. You could just play vanilla Dark Souls 1 if you don't want it. It works both ways. Come on. This guy must be the only person on Earth that just wants the same game twice. Like, I guess this is highly subjective, mind you. I just don't think his arguments for it really hold up. But, you know, a whole new experience would be amazing, especially for people that have already played the game to death. Scholar was great for this, and it really refreshed Dark Souls 2 for me personally, so I don't see why... Most people wouldn't feel that way. Personally, I think the random mimic drops was a pretty small point. I'd even go as far as say randomise the mimic chests themselves each new game cycle, but I mean, that's just me. At what point would a mimic giving you a lightning spear or a fire hand axe really matter? I mean, I can live without this change obviously, but it seems like a, like a nice novelty. If you ask me, you know, the gargoyles might drop one of three items, so why is, again, that okay? Speedrunners just won't use, like, the random mimic crate drops then, obviously. Like, why does it matter? What speedrunners ever used any of the fucking mimic items? Well, I'm glad we agree on the option of being able to map jump to stick, of course. Good that it's an option. Faster ladder climbing. Sure. Glad we agree. So... On to revamping the classes. Now, I really don't see how having the classes with even stats is a bad thing. Also, I think you like super misunderstood me. I also don't want the you know, the classes to have evenly distributed stats. I want them to have the same amount of stats distributed differently amongst them. The real challenge of the classes isn't the stats in the early game, it's their equipment setup. You know, one setup might work for one person and not another. Personally, I see the classes more as a jumping off point for a build rather than like the difficulty setting. I mean, ultimately, it's not that big of a deal either, realistically, but you know, it means far less unused stats for your build in the end game, and that's good, and maybe a slightly harder early game for some people for some builds potentially. Moving on to soul vessels, and it's actually highly interesting that you agreed with this point, because I honestly thought that you wouldn't agree with it, you know, whatsoever. However, it's again very interesting how you'd be for this and not others, but it is good that you agree with this because a soul vessel is like such an incredibly useful thing to have, especially if you really just don't fancy doing the whole game all over again. It really is incredibly, incredibly player friendly, PvE and PvP players alike. Okay, moving on to the point about Soul of Cinder and Gwyn, I thought that this would be extremely obvious enough, but apparently not. If anybody got it the first time, please tell me, but it means make Gwyn unparryable. 
That's all, that's all I meant, right? No Gwyn being stupidly fucking easy as the last boss does not add to its charm. It just cheapens the experience and you know it. Gwyn deserves to be challenging as an end boss, he really does. And without being able to parry him, Gwyn definitely does become a pretty challenging boss. I'd say a fitting end for Dark Souls 1. Patrolling mobs. This really does come down to the same argument as changing the item placements, doesn't it? My whole argument is the game should feel a little different than Dark Souls 1 vanilla. Patrolling mobs means the player can't really stay in the same place for too long, and you know, there's already a few examples of patrolling mobs in Dark Souls 1 anyway. A few. Not many, but they are there, and there's lots of patrolling mobs in Demon's Souls as well. Now, it can also make for unexpected combat encounters potentially, and it gives the world a little bit more life to it. I mean, sure it is unnecessary, but most things are unnecessary. Running while locked on. So, yeah, it was cleared up, you know, that you can only run forward, not like, sprint to the side and stuff. To be honest, it's probably fine not to change. It probably wouldn't make a whole lot of difference either way, but I will admit that this point and the Omni rolling are probably two things that I can take or leave, honestly. I think that maybe the omnidirectional running and rolling go hand in hand on some level, probably. But again though, change doesn't have to be bad. The extra control it gives over your character is nice, and it translates the gameplay into 2018 just a little bit nicer. I will admit though, is arguments for locking and unlocking are completely valid and totally have merit, but I just think that, again, you know, I can take it or leave it, but if we're arguing for it, it just translates the game into 2018 that little bit better. Optional NG+, plus, totally fine. Easily one of the least impactful changes that could be made. Glad we agree. Boss HP buff, again, glad we agree. Surprised you agreed on that one, but I'm glad you agree. I think it's fairly necessary in some bosses. Lighting bonfires sets it as a respawn target instead of sitting at them. Again, glad we agree. Totally unnecessary that wasn't a thing. So finally we're on to poise and this is actually the kind of response that I love because as much as I don't think that I'm wrong, he does make great points on top of mine. You really shouldn't be able to boost equip weight up super high to fast rolling heavy armours. Splitting equip weight and endurance certainly helps with this as well, you know. The thing is, poise really is still an issue, and being able to poise through attacks and backstab people at the end of their animations is proof of this. It certainly would be less of an issue if backstabs had a wind up like in Dark Souls 3, and I really feel like it's hard to argue against this point because this is what happens on the regular, we've all experienced it. Now look, my suggestions are not gospel, that is all they are, suggestions, meant for discussion. Especially when it comes to poise, because it's a mechanic that makes perfect sense, but in reality, theory only gets you so far, you just have to see how things panned out in practical tests. Anyway, in terms of dialing back poise, I meant things such as, maybe, the number only refers to the size of weapon that you can take one hit from, and then it will break the poise, or certain attacks will always break poise, like great swords or two-handed R2s, or charge attacks, if they were added, give poise damage boost, or have poise only work in non-walking running animations, or indeed some weapons should just do more poise damage, or armors have less poise value, so it still works out the same, you just don't have people tanking 3 or 4 hits, walking around you, backstabbing you. It can actually make a lot of weapons quite impractical because any recovery animations can be so unfairly punished. I think his assertions on my poise limits to carry weight are kind of unfair, because the stats of Dark Souls 1 really aren't that complicated at all. The only truly cryptic thing that all the Souls games share is the weird erratic nature of the amount of scaling damage weapons get. It seems pretty simple to me, honestly. Oh, I'm at 25% and even though this armour has more poise, if I stay under 25%, I don't gain more poise overall. Interesting. That's about as complicated as that gets. And again, again, it's just a suggestion. The main point I'm making is poise is a fantastic concept, but it could be refined. Let's discuss. Offhand combat? This one really fucks me up at the disagreement, actually. How would being able to use your left hand weapon to a better degree be bad in any way? Instead of doing rolling running attacks with the right hand weapon with R1, L1 makes you do it with the left. Sorry, but there's a reason why it really was fantastic in Dark Souls 2 and why I was so shocked they removed it from Dark Souls 3. It only adds to the depth of the combat and it allows for better role playing as well. There, really, there is no downsides that I can possibly see to this. Personally, you know, I can take or leave bonfire aesthetics, but they were a cool thing in Dark Souls 2, and I don't see why they can't be in Dark Souls 1. All it does is add variety to the gameplay, and 
just from spitballing ideas here, I feel like you could have a really cool interaction with the Gravelord Covenant as well. Like, if you use an aesthetic, it prioritises you for being Gravelorded. Next on the list, attack charging. I don't see why this would be bad, of all things. All attack charging does is allow you to stagger your attacks. Great for baiting and rewards good timing with risk taking. None of the combat changes I've suggested mess with the mechanics in a way we, you know, have seen to be detrimental in, like, later games or whatever. Personally, I feel like attack charging would work perfectly in Dark Souls 1. In fact, I always kind of felt like it was something that was missing, even before Dark Souls 2 and 3. So, I really thought you'd be against streamlining the upgrade system, but, you know, frankly, yeah, it is unnecessary, like all the rest of the changes. Nothing needs to be changed, arguably, but, again, why not attempt to make things better if you can? The upgrade system would be a prime example of something that doesn't make a whole lot of sense in 2018. I do like the cryptic nature of Dark Souls, but I don't think faffing about menus really adds much to any game. Embers, gems, titanite, it's all that's really needed frankly, and there's a reason for why it was so satisfying in Dark Souls 2 and 3. There's absolutely nothing wrong with taking good elements from later games and incorporating them. Like I said, all of these changes will give Dark Souls 1 its own charm, but even then, I don't think any of these will take so much away from the original as to make it feel totally alien. The charm of Dark Souls comes from the NPCs. The voice acting, the world design, the level design, the lore that's involved in all of that, which creates this place that really feels like a dead barren land clinging to the last scraps of life it has left. Mildly changing a few mechanics to make it more playable slash add variety definitely, definitely won't change that feeling. And if it's done right, which there's no reason why it can't be, and it's pointless to simply assume it will be bad, hence, you know, never try to improve anything, Anyway, it, it can potentially only help to solidify and improve the charm the original had. It would be like visiting an old friend after you've both grown and changed after years to find out you still get on just as much, except now they have a car and access to a lot of weed. Here we go. Another point where you just say it will be bad without considering other potential options. Dark Souls 2 done a good job of making the gradient between the light roll and the 70% roll usable but different enough so it's not an impossible task, clearly. It would just be nice if there was a system that could do the same in Dark Souls 1. I just think that my poise limits example gives reason to do this, but again all I'm doing is suggesting improvements but highlighting issues that isn't even unique to Dark Souls 1. I mean, yeah Dark Souls 1 is at its best at 25% but that 25% represents both a fast build and a tanky build. In an RPG, you'd think that these things would be different. And, you know, that way a tanky build is probably going to be slower, but can take more hits and vice versa. This only adds to build variety, and I don't see how that doesn't apply to both PvP and PvE. It's not about making fat rolling work in PvP, or indeed PvE, but it's about what advantages do you get if you have to be fat rolling. Adding in dark damage is, again, one of my best case scenario points. Yes, right, it would be a fair amount of work, but why limit our discussive hypothetical fantasy scenario to only what someone could reasonably arse, like, be arsed to do? If dark damage was added into the game, all it's doing is adding an extra layer of depth and complexity to the combat and mechanics in the game. It doesn't matter how unrealistic or how much fucking time it would take, that isn't the whole point of the list at all. Gesture cancelling. Now, a mod does this, and uh, unbelievably, <laughs> but it works really nice. Small but welcome change to stop cunts backstabbing you after a bow. Glad you agree. Right, four ring slots. So this point came with a huge asterisk that I should have mentioned. This would only be possible if all the rings were rebalanced along with the poise and weight of armors, etc. as well. Which I'm not personally against, frankly, as again, you know, those things wouldn't really change the overall feel of the game, I wouldn't think. But, you know, we've discussed all this already. I get that if nothing else was changed, adding four ring slots would be fucking horrible. I should probably have acknowledged this in the previous video. Ultimately, your arguments aren't incorrect, and there's been maybe three or four points that, you know, I see why people would be so against without a lot of explanation, this being one of them. But, if the rings were rebalanced, like you said, you know, take away the equip weight from the fat ring, and other such things, I reckon four ring slots could add a lot of variety to the game. So, I'm glad we agree on another point, and it's that decks shouldn't affect cast speed. Uh, and as a side note, you mentioned resistance in this point as well, and it, perhaps, just spitballing ideas here, if poise became balanced in some way, it's possible that resistance could give you a little bit of poise as you level that up. 
instead of doing nothing. So talking about the removal of stagger animations, let's put a little bit of context to this. I felt that with lag and instant backstabs, wind down animations from attacks became, in my opinion, like really unfairly punishable. Now yeah, a lot of halberds and stuff are great and highly usable weapons, I guess my point is actually really more about how these animations interact with the backstabs. So I guess if you fixed backstabs, this problem just completely goes away, so really actually retract this point and I would rather it just be fixed backstabs. <laughs> Look at this, another point we agree on, post boss invasion items. You know, this is needed for all Souls games really, some people do just want a PvP, it's as simple as that, and you just leave us alone, right? <laughs> Like, do we really need to ruin their experience for literally no reason? If they want a PvP, let them PvP. Because it's easy, it's easy enough to not PvP, but sometimes it's hard to PvP. Let's just make it easier, why not? I understand people not liking the HP cut idea. So at this point, I get it, it is super subjective. And I totally understand that. I personally like the mechanic because it makes humanity's embers effigies hold a lot more value. And I, I like that it makes the game... Punishing. Simple as that. In Dark Souls 1, you could play the full game Hollowed, which essentially put you offline, and for that reason, I think there should be an HP cut. If you want to bypass being invaded, then you should pay a cost, because invasions are meant as part of the Dark Souls experience. And I get that, you know, a lot of people are going to disagree with me here, though I understand. Just remember, this is all just my opinion, guys. Some people will agree, others won't, and I know that. I just don't like the way and the reasoning for certain people's disagreement because all I'm doing is just giving my opinion. Here we go, second last point, New Londo Bonfire. You kind of seem to agree here. If I was to put one anywhere, I'd put it up where you find the composite bow, but your suggestion is also totally fine and good. Perhaps put it next to the soul of a firekeeper, that, that'd be kind of cool in my opinion. It's just a small quality of life change that, you know, the run from Firelink doesn't add any skill to the game, it's, it's just time, you know? And it's not that big a point, but it doesn't have to be. And finally, the last point, weapon arts. I feel like out of all my points, this one has made people think that I want Dark Souls 3 more than anything else, and I cannot stress to you enough how much that is not the case. As I've said before, there's a lot more to just weapon arts and omnidirectional role into Dark Souls 3 that makes it Dark Souls 3. Now, this point is on the list because a lot of people asked for it. I like it personally, and I think it actually does make a little bit of sense because some weapons like the dragon weapons in Dark Souls 1 have a special attack anyway. I don't see how weapon arts are hurting the game as they've added a lot of depth and variety to Dark Souls 3 combat. They would obviously, right, have to be balanced for Dark Souls 1, but I feel like that should be fairly obvious. Now again, this is another point that I could take or leave, but it's just a fun suggestion that would give a new Dark Souls 1 its own flavour. But again, this point would require other points to be balanced along with it for it to exist. I feel like this should be obvious, and in no way do I think, oh, just take weapon arts exactly as they are in Dark Souls 3 and then just put them in Dark Souls 1. No, I mean like, give Dark Souls 1 its own version of weapon arts. <sighs> so I'm finally finished this video. I really hope you at least enjoyed the discussion, and I hope if you watched the previous one and you disagreed that, well, maybe, you know, you don't even have to agree. I would just hope that you can at least accept my personal taste for a Dark Souls 1 remaster, and would at least think my ideas are good. Yeah, I mean, I'd like that, it's about as much as I could ask for, right? So, I mean, comment and subscribe and like if you otherwise enjoyed it, right? Now, my next video is going to be a moron's guide to installing Dark Souls 1 mods to get the remaster that we all deserve on PC, because frankly, I think we should all be playing the Rekindled plus Prepare to Die Again mod, like, they're just so good, so I'm going to show you how to do it. That way, you don't need to spend all the time I did fucking faffing about. You can just know how to do it. I'll have the video nice and concise. So again, the last thing I'm going to do, like every other video, is just give a big shout out to all the patrons on Patreon, helping out the channel, helping me. I, I can't thank you enough over the years. I really, really fucking can't. And yeah, I, I just hope that you're enjoying the videos I'm putting out. I'm just so sorry that I can't put out videos as regularly as I'd like to. Just life really fucking gets in the way all the time. It really fucking does. But that is the end of the video. I don't want to go over the 40 minute mark. So yeah, I guess I will see you in the next video. Bye guys.